I was beginning to feel like a fish out of water until at least one presenter mentioned the word erosion, and then somebody else showed a, uh, a picture of a gully, so I'm sweet. <laughs> okay, here we go. Right, quick, quick outline. Um, I'll just run through basically uh, the history of what we've done over the last 15 years. Uh, some of the research questions uh, we wanted to uh, answer. How we did it, uh, the excavation methods, the measurements, the analyses, what we found, some few pictures of some successful treatments using vegetation, and finally uh, what we produced at the end of it. Now, uh, we have to go back to the, uh, the 60s and 70s, where the early tree root studies focused on exotic trees, and it was, uh, and, and again, the focus of looking at those trees was, was purely from an erosion control perspective. No other reason, really. And then following Cyclone Bola, um, there's this increased interest in Manuka Karnaka, uh, mainly because it uh, performed so well as, a, as an erosion control uh, species, and it was really quite obvious that we had good Manuka uh, Karnaka densities, that uh, there were fewer landslides on the hill country compared to the, the pasture next door, or to young pines even next door to that. Uh, so we looked at the root systems of those. Then, uh, let's see, about the 80s, there was a resurgence in the interest of uh, the native species. Uh, firstly, for looking at the riparian species as uh, sediment and nutrient filters. Uh, and then later on, uh, the podocarp hardwood species, mainly from the, uh, the carbon perspective. There's a lot of interest in carbon sequestration. Then we moved to poplar and willow, just to reevaluate the effectiveness of those species uh, as erosion control, um, mainly around the controversy of how many poplars and willows you need as open um, as uh, space plantings on farmland to uh, actually control different types of erosion. And more recently, or well, the most recent trial, we're now looking at uh, longer rotation exotic species uh, that may also have uh, prospects for providing erosion control. The science needs, uh, I say at the time, but the science needs changed through time. Um, but basically, overall, we needed a better understanding of the function of the root systems in stabilising our soils and, and again, the hillsides. Uh, to do that, we needed measurements of root growth with the emphasis on establishing uh, the sphere of influence of individual trees at different uh, ages uh, and at different stand densities. We also needed measurements of above ground growth parameters um, to construct what are known as allometric relationships. Um, how, how, much, how much effort does a plant put into its root systems as opposed to its above ground growth? Um, and that differs between species and it's also age dependent. Um, then came uh, the carbon issue, came along and uh, people suddenly realised, well, there's quite a bit of carbon stored in root systems, but nobody knew how much. So, did a bit of work there. And uh, we need to uh, assess the potential erosion control effectiveness of the alternative exotic tree species. Um, there is a move towards, as I say, longer rotation uh, exotics, get away from radiata pine. Um, but again, we don't know how effective those different exotic species might be in the longer term. How did we approach the task? Uh, early days, uh, forest service, we had access to um, fire hoses and, and lots of trees and buried away in forests and nobody could uh, keep an eye on what we were actually doing. We made a hell of a mess, but uh, th those are some of the root systems we exposed and then later measured. There's one poor guy on the end of a hose um, sluicing out uh, Karnaka in this case. Then we had to move, um, we moved away from looking at the exotics, we moved to uh, looking at natives. And uh, because we couldn't go out into the dock estate and help ourselves to trees and make a hell of a mess, squirting water around, we had to go to the plot approach. And so we established these plots 
Um, this particular one is uh, the riparian plant species. And instead of water, well, you can't use water on a flat surface because it's got no, nowhere to drain away. Uh, so we use compressed air. And that gadget there is known as an air lance, just on the end of a, uh, a hose. And uh, on a, a site like this, which is just uh, basically fine alluvium, it blasted away the, the soil wonderfully and uh, it didn't destroy the root systems. Uh, even the root hairs, the fine root hairs, remained attached. Oh. Then we tried another technique. Um, this is a, a three-year-old poplar. There's a stump there, um, quite a big tree. Um, basically, we just start at the extremity of where we think the, uh, the, uh, the root system ends, and we work our way uh, back towards the, the trunk in 50 centimeter intervals, and just measure the roots as they're exposed. Um, other things we did in the field, uh, this is known as a shear box test, and basically it's to measure the, um, uh, the contribution that roots um, have in reinforcing a block of soil. Um, so we would do these sorts of measurements uh, with, with a, a block of soil that had no roots and compare that to a block of soil that had roots within it. And that's just some of the uh, instrumentation involved. Uh, so, a, a shear box there with weights on it and a, uh, a cranking device where you apply the stress and then everything's recorded on the computer. That's the shear box there. Oh, this, is a, this is the block of soil that we carve. Um, they cut the, the, that stump off there. This is a carnica in this case. We put the shear box on top of there, put the weights on top of the shear box, crank this gadget here, um, and it displaces the, the block of soil and uh, we measure the displacement, how much, how much stress it actually takes to displace a block. Um, before we do these tests, we um, simulate a block of soil under saturated conditions, because that's when most hillsides uh, or soils fail. So um, the soils are wetted up over a 24 hour period. Karnaka, um, it's the extent that we went to. Uh, I think these are 40 year old Karnaka. Uh, sluiced out in this particular case, and um, then they're, they're sketched um, for bird's eye view, but also naturally. Um, what have we got here? We've got a willow, three-year-old willow. Um, once we've excavated a, a, a tree root system in its entirety, um, sometimes we measured it in the field in bits and pieces, uh, but the whole ones we took back to a, a processing place, and uh, uh, we started cutting it up, basically. And this is the process. We start at the extremity of the roots, uh, of the root system, and we work our way back uh, towards the stump in 50 centimeter intervals, uh, sever the roots up, um, and uh, bag them separately. So we're working in concentric circles uh, in towards the, the plant, uh, in, in towards the stump, sorry. And then for each of those uh, the roots cut off within a concentric circle. Um, they're all uh, separated into diameter size classes, 1 to 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 50 millimetre diameters. And then for each of these, they're laid out and uh, the total length is accumulated. Then the roots go into a drying oven, uh, so everything's um, measured by dry weight. Okay, other measurements we made at the same time for the above ground, uh, tree height, canopy spread, collar diameter, collar, collars at ground level, diameter of breast height, standard forestry measure, branches are separated from the stem and weighed separately, um, dried first and then weighed. Below ground we measured tens root tensile strength, root spread, root depth, and the stump weight, again dry weights. Uh, so our aim, as I said earlier, was to produce allometric relationships of the, uh, between above and below ground uh, growth rates at different stages uh, in the growth cycle. Uh, we used the root spread data to model optimum plant spacing for effective erosion control. In other words, that means how close do your, your trees have to be to afford stability um, to your slope. If you have them too far apart, 
and the roots don't overlap, then you can get landsliding in between the trees. Um, we use the root depth data to match appropriate species to the function expected of the plantings. Um, some people plant very shallow rooted species in situations where they get undermined, for example, along stream banks. So it's an appropriate use, inappropriate use of a species. So you need to know something about how deep their roots will go and what, what performance, you know, what, what function they can perform for that particular site. Then got into calculated uh, percent carbon content for the root systems. Irrespective of species, it turns out to be about somewhere between 23 and 30 percent. Um, we use the data uh, just for species, general species comparisons. Um, how quickly does one grow relative to the other, either in terms of height or uh, root spread or root depth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we also did comparisons of root tensile strength. That's a funny measure because scientists are going away from that as a, as a measure of effectiveness, if you like, um, because quite often we find that when soils fail under saturated conditions, um, it's, it's the soil itself that fails before the root does. So irrespective of what the root, how strong the root is, the soils give way before the root does. So it's not really a good indicator of how effective a particular species might be based on its roots tensile strength. Okay, all root systems are different. Top one's a cowry. Um, we didn't know it had a tap root, but it has. Uh, it has definite beginnings of a, a tap root system. Um, bottom one, titoki, uh, incredibly shallow, very, very shallow. Most native species, uh, apart from the ones that have tap roots, um, the, the, the depth, oh, I should qualify this. Uh, most of the experiments, particularly on the natives, were only for trees up, up to uh, age five. That was as far as we could take the experiment. Um, so some of these dimensions are, are specific to you know, year five trees, if you like. Um, but, but by year five, um, none, of the, none of the root systems, apart from the ones that had tap roots, were deeper than 30 centimetres. So they are surface feeders. They follow the, they follow the uh, organic soil's surface. Uh, some species have really spindly, long, splendy um, uh, roots that go along the surface of very little fibrous roots, like Pittosmorum. Others are very compact and almost totally fibrous with very few uh, short-ranging um, what we might call structural roots. Ah, just reinforcing the fact that they're very shallow, and you can see how plate-like they are. No more than about 30 centimetres at this age. There are all sorts of other interesting nodules and things um, associated with the roots, but I won't go into that. Um, just to show uh, what are we doing here, um, some of the podocarp hardwoods, just uh, maximum root spreads that we were getting between years one and five. Um, where are we? So year one is the first bar, two, three, four, five, the same all the way along. Puriri was the outstanding performer by year five. Um, but even then, um, maximum root spread is just over two metres. Um, this is by individual plant. Um, total root length. Oh, this is an interesting one. You can see the scale. This was... Oh, year, year one and two, outstanding. One was a Tongoyo pole. Look at this, two kilometres of structural root. Two kilometres and a two-year-old friggin' tree. It's just, just <laughs> pretty amazing. M mind you, again, I should stress, this, 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 um, these were plot-grown, so ideal conditions, nice soil, plenty of moisture. In fact, they were irrigated to ensure they survive. Um, you wouldn't get these sorts of dimensions on a, on a hillside, for example. I have colleagues in Palmerston North uh, who, who emulated the same trial uh, on a very compact Tokamaru silt loam. Totally different results. Absolute contrast. All right, going back to the shear box, this is the difference between... Um, this is the amount of force that you apply to that shear box. And the bottom line is for a, a fallow soil, in other words, no roots, so it's just, just a block of soil. So it only took 10 to 15 
kilopascals of force for the block to fail at that point there. And it had only been displaced a matter of 15 millimetres before the block failed. This is under saturated conditions. Same, same soil, but has roots. You have to apply twice as much force to get it to fail. It failed about 30 kilopascals force. So the root contribution is huge. Um, each of these little steps here is when individual roots snapped. We could hear them snapping as we displaced the block. Um, so, yeah, it was quite an interesting experiment. Uh, where are we? Enormous differences in growth rate between the species. These uh, four-year-old natives, cabbage tree, the dreaded toot, uh, caprosma somewhere there. That's a poplar shelter belt, ignore that. <coughs> um, compared to a, a, a poplar, that's a two-year-old, I, I think it was a kawa, I'm not sure, Veronese or a kawa. Um, just absolutely enormous. Um, examples of appropriate and successful treatments using vegetation. I'm just going to quickly go through a slide representing each of these. Uh, I'm not pushing any particular species, but bear in mind that some species perform in, in some situations better than others. Uh, so it all comes down to what it is you're trying to treat, uh, how you approach it, you know, what species you use. So bear in mind, I'm not pushing anything in particular. Right. Uh, shallow landslides, earth flows, gullies, use of vegetation as sediment traps uh, to stop the expansion of gully erosion on farmland and to try and establish some sort of stability to a bank that's um, being undercut. Right, this is uh, April 2012. Uh, 2012? 2011. 2011. Thank you. Wai yeah. Yeah. What a difference a few trees made. Here, Unfortunately, there's so much rain that the soil's saturated uh, and they, they failed, obviously. Here, you've got the combination of the, um, the interception value of a, a closed canopy stand. In this case, it happens to be pines. It didn't really matter what species it would be. It would have performed just as well as the pines. And then you've got the added contribution of the reinforcement of the, the root systems held that slope together. Earth flows. Before and after picture, same, same site. Um, oh, back here. This, this slope here was moving at rates uh, during the winter of two and three meters, you know, down slope. The whole damn thing was moving. That one was moving, that one was moving. Um, decided to plant it. This was an experimental site, and we, we measured the displacement rates by having transects across there for about four or five years. Then we planted it and tried to measure the same transects for as long as we could see the, uh, the pegs. Um, um, but just look at the contrast. I mean, this, this has stopped. Uh, after about eight to 10 years, once that canopy had closed, that, that earth flow displacement stopped almost completely. Uh, and the only time it's reactivated was following cyclone Bola, when we had five days um, uh, of cyclone Bola. 83, 80, 88, that's right, 88. 88, so the trees were five years old. There was some reactivation. Uh, the canopy hadn't closed by that time, that's right. But within eight to 10 years, once the canopy had closed, then that, that slope stopped moving um, almost completely. Uh, gully erosion, same feature, um, photographed over three points in time. Um, there are very few options that you could have applied to this other than blanket afforestation, full afforestation. There was no good planting poles in there. They wouldn't have bloody lasted, poplars or willows. Uh, you could have left it to revert, would have taken too long, and that feature would have got bigger and uglier before reversion could have taken hold uh, with a lot more sediment ending up in the, in the river system. So blanket afforestation was the appropriate uh, even then, it, it took uh, two goes at it. You can see there's a species change between there and there. So obviously this area, the plants didn't establish first time around, so they went back in a second time, had another go at it, completely successful. This is Mangatu Forest, for those who know the area. In Europe, they're using these um, live 
Uh, I suppose you could call them dams or fascines. Uh, uh, what else could we call them? Hedges. Yeah, oh, there's all sorts of names for them anyway. Uh, and I think the, I'm not sure of the species, but anyway, the aim is, is to trap uh, the sediment coming down off here um, and holding it up in the upper basin rather than seeing it flushed out through the system. Danger with this is, uh, and this is what they found out at Mangatu Forest when they tried to contain the tarn, the sediment coming out of the Tarndale, is that every time you get a, a big enough uh, a storm event, you create uh, what are known as debris flows, so it's a, a mass of sediment and water all going down the system at the same time that completely wipes these structures out. So they could be creating a, a hazard for themselves further down the track. Um, but it all comes down to how big the watershed is in behind this feature um, as to whether that the development of debris flows is a possibility or not. And the appropriate use of poplar and willow, very good example here. I think it's in it's, yeah, it's Waimata Valley. Um, features like this, if you catch them early enough, you can stabilize them very successfully with, uh, with prudent plantings. You don't need to go to blanket afforestation and uh, um, the land can carry on being used as, as farmland. These are our challenges, these really are. Uh, stream banks, particularly those that are being undermined, this is only very weak uh, alluvium, you know, gravels, sand, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, steep banks, um, there isn't a, a, a tree root system that I know that would, if you planted along the perimeter there, would stabilize that. So uh, we're into uh, alternative choices of a combination of engineering and um, uh, using plants at the same time to, to control features like that, simply because the bank height is too high. Uh, other situations, more benign streams uh, like this one, you can plant them up very successfully. Um, this is somebody's schematic design of what they would, they would plant. I don't necessarily, I don't agree with Toy Toy, I'm afraid. Uh, I think that's a bit of a disaster. Um, but certainly flaxes, uh, flaxes and the odd cabbage tree in, within the high water zone. Um, and then you can plant anything up here you like. Um, in this region, we're blessed with uh, the regeneration rates of Manuka and Karnaka. And uh, the wise people, the wise landowners, leave it to regenerate within these uh, watercourses. Uh, big, tall trees on a, on a stream bank that's being undercut. Um, there's, there's no hope in hell uh, that any sort of vegetation is, is going to, or by itself, is going to be able to control these sorts of situations. Uh, the material is just so easily removed by, by undercutting. Um, so again, a combination of uh, engineering, bioengineering type techniques. Uh, what have we produced? How oh, there's untold papers out there. Um, lots of conference presentations have come out of it. I'll show you these posters. They're free for downloading. Um, these riparian posters, these um, are the ones on the native plants. Right. Acknowledgements. Uh, those are my colleagues, um, some of which contribute to this work. Others are working alongside of us in other, um, other regions. Um, uh, Polytech, yes, this is where we grew. This is where we had these, these successive trials, first the native plants, then the, uh, sorry, the riparian plants, then the podocarps, and then the, uh, this is the poplar and willow at establishment time. And then we follow, there's another trial still to be finished. It'll come out. Uh, third year plants will come out in next month. Uh, so the Polytech have been very understanding at us uh, blasting their soil to hell and mixing it all up. And yeah, very good of them. Uh, and to Peter, Peter Manson, thank you for supplying some of the uh, poplar and willow material. Or the poplar, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. And the district council came to the party with uh, some of the material as well. And an apology to La Alana, Matafera Nurseries, where we sourced all our uh, native plant seedlings and then promptly killed them all. <laughs> Sorry about that. And that's me.